Trump's rhetoric is getting increasingly dark and more explicitly fascistic as we get closer and closer to Election Day. And as a result, some pundits finally feel comfortable enough using the F word to describe him after nearly 10 years. But that now begs the question, since we all mostly agree that he is indeed a fascist, what kind of a fascist is he and how bad would things get? in a Trump second term on a scale from Orban to Hitler. Now, people still understandably scoff at Hitler comparisons because it does feel hyperbolic. But I mean, his own running mate wondered if he'd be America's Hitler. But in reality, Trump isn't identical to Hitler in every single way. But there are certain similarities between him and Hitler, as well as specific conditions that made pre-Nazi Germany fertile ground for the rise of fascism that does feel eerily similar to the conditions in present day America. And I think it's important and necessary to point that out. So I want to start with a more recent ominous statement from Donald Trump that served as, I think, a wake up call to some pundits who were still apprehensive about using the F word. I think the bigger problem is the enemy from within, not even the people that have come in and destroying our country, by the way, totally destroying our country, the towns, the villages, they're being inundated. But I don't think they're the problem in terms of election day. I think the bigger problem are the people from within. We have some very bad people. We have some sick people, radical left lunatics. And I think they're the, and, and it should be very easily handled by, if necessary, by National Guard or if really necessary by the military. Understand that is a direct threat of violence. He is threatening to use the American military to violently go after his radical left political opponents who he views as the enemy within. And one of the first things that fascists always do when they take power is they target their political opponents by getting them to either convert to their fascist orthodoxy or by using state power to crush them violently if they refuse to acquiesce. And unsurprisingly, one of the first things that Hitler did was also target his political opponents in order to consolidate power. The Holocaust Encyclopedia explains the Nazis persecuted non-Jewish German opponents, both real and perceived, whether they were political, communist, social Democrats, Democrats, spiritual, Jehovah's Witnesses, or social homosexuals opponents, Nazi racial theory held that they were valuable members of the race. These non-Jewish German opponents needed to understand their racial value and then follow their restored natural instinct to do the right thing, accept and internalize the Nazi vision of the world. Given the Nazis' public aims of destroying the Marxist threat in Germany and tearing up the Versailles Treaty, aims that were shared by a majority of the German population, Hitler's political opponents were the first victims of systematic Nazi persecution. And that makes sense because allowing dissent diminishes state power. So this is why so many fascists around the world and throughout history make it their first priority to go after their political opponents first. Now, this is not a one-to-one -one comparison to Trump and the Republican Party, obviously, but the fascistic mindset is very similar. Trump's divisive us versus them rhetoric pits real Americans against the enemies who want to destroy America or who have destroyed America. And if you replace Jehovah's Witnesses with Muslims and add trans people to the social category alongside homosexuals, well, it seems pretty similar to what we're seeing today. Trump has already laid out plans to either banish these opponents or get them to acquiesce. He's talked about banning gender affirming care in all 50 states, which would lead to the forcible detransition of trans Americans, and he's threatened to deport pro-Palestinian protesters. And if you choose to exercise your First Amendment rights and protest this, he's already stated that he intends to use the Insurrection Act to violently shut down these protests, which is something that he would be able to do as commander in chief since he take control of the military and using the military for fascistic means is exactly what Hitler did as well during World War II. Both generals and rank and file members of the German military were complicit in the Nazi crimes. Now, I'm sure that he'd consider actual leftists like you or myself the enemy within. I want you to understand that he is using this as a catch all term to describe anyone who would oppose him if he got elected, including news pundits and media companies that he wants to shut down. Now, this isn't theoretical. He's explicitly said that he wants to revoke the licenses of media companies that he thinks are biased against him. So CBS gets a license and the license is based on honesty. I think they have to take their license away. 60 minutes should be taken off the air for what they've done. And you know what else, John? They should lose their license. I think that 60 Minutes should go off the air. I think it's the worst broadcast scandal I've ever heard. No, it's not journalism. They don't do journalism over well, It's also election interference. 
it also is license threatening. You know, they have a license from, that's not cable. They, here they have a license from the federal government. And they, they pay nothing. They pay peanuts, they pay nothing. They should take that license away from CBS. Him going after CBS is one of many examples. Trump allies also threatened to revoke the federal contract of a consulting firm for criticizing J.D. Vance. And going after opponents in media or opponents with a lot of influence makes a lot of sense if you're an authoritarian because they pose the biggest threat to legitimacy since they have very large platforms. Now, unsurprisingly, Hitler also destroyed free speech in Germany when he came to power. The Holocaust Encyclopedia explains, when the Nazis came to power in 1933, the German constitution guaranteed freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Through decrees and laws, the Nazis abolished these civil rights and destroyed German democracy. Starting in 1934, it was illegal to criticize the Nazi government. Even telling a joke about Hitler was considered treachery. People in Nazi Germany could not say or write whatever they wanted. Examples of censorship under the Nazis included closing down or taking over anti-Nazi newspapers, banning and burning books that the Nazis categorized as un-German, among other examples. But I mean, it sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Now, maybe you still think that it's not that uncanny or argue that Trump is more similar to different fascists throughout history. And I think that you can make that case. But when it comes to immigrants, I don't think anybody would deny that Trump sounds a lot like Hitler when he talks about them. And that's because he infamously quoted Mein Kampf when talking about immigrants. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. They poison. Now, that could just be a coincidence, but I'd argue mm, that's probably not the case since he admitted that he owned a copy of Mein Kampf, but claims that he's never read it. And his ex-wife, Ivana, told her attorney back in 1990 that Trump kept Hitler speeches beside his bed, which is sus, to put it mildly. And even though that in a vacuum is horrifying enough, it doesn't speak to the depths of Trump's hatred for immigrants and how far he's willing to go to demonize them. For example, on Twitter, in an unnecessarily long post, he described the presence of immigrants in this country as an invasion and vowed to liberate us from said invasion and went on to say that he would use a law from 1798 to expel them and that expulsion right there would deny them due process. And that law was used during during World War II against Japanese Americans when they were placed in internment camps. So the fact that he's talking about the enemy within and citing that law from 1798 is very conspicuous. And him framing this as a war is deliberate because it primes people to think about what a proportionate response would be to said invasion, which would be violence because you respond to war with self-defense violently. And even though he'll often try to specify that he's only talking about criminal immigrants, even though he thinks they all commit crimes, if you listen to his speeches, he makes it clear that he thinks all immigrants are criminals for some reason. At a minimum, they're also criminals since they're here illegally, but the problem with that is even legal Haitian immigrants in Springfield, Ohio are guilty according to him as well. He accused them of eating people's pets and vowed to deport them too, even though they did not eat people's pets and that lie was created by a neo-Nazi group called Blood Tribe. But now he's saying he's gonna deport them too. They're here legally, so what's the excuse for that? Well, they're criminals according to him because they did the crime of eating people's pets. And at a rally in Aurora, Colorado, he named his mass deportation plan regarding Venezuelan migrants as Operation Aurora and claimed that Aurora was infested with Venezuelan gang members. So he's concocted this narrative about immigrants and how they're all existential threats and the literal survival of the country hinges on them being expelled. That's why he's running on mass deportation. He's not hiding it. His rhetoric is explicitly fascistic. You can't deny that. And his rhetoric arguably goes further than some of the far right European parties who form specifically in opposition to immigration. Trump is more extreme than them, depending on the politician. But the reason why this type of divisive rhetoric works so well is because Americans are desperate and desperate populations are susceptible to radicalization and can easily be preyed upon by demagogues who claim to have solutions to all of the problems that they're facing. Can't find a job? Well, that's because immigrants took all the jobs. Feeling like you can't afford to pay the bills anymore? Well, that's because Democrats are giving away all of our resources to immigrants instead of you. 
It's an incorrect solution, but a solution nonetheless. But that same economic anxiety was also present in German culture before Hitler's rise, and it was caused in part by the failure of government back in the Weimar Republic to actually deliver for the people coupled with the Wall Street crash of 1929. But that political climate made the Nazis' message more appealing to a population that was really desperate, especially because the Nazi party didn't just run on anti-Semitism, they ran on economic populism in some ways as well, even though they didn't deliver on that. And as the Holocaust Encyclopedia explains, while most Germans disapproved of anti-Jewish violence, dislike of Jews easily stirred up in hard times extended far beyond the Nazi party faithful. The majority of Germans at least passively accepted discrimination against Jews. During periods preceding new measures against Jews, propaganda campaigns created an atmosphere tolerant of violence against Jews. In some cases, the campaigns exploited the violence, both calculated and spontaneous, that ensued. The goal was to encourage passivity and acceptance of anti-Jewish laws and decrees as a vehicle to restore public order. Propaganda that demonized Jews also served to prepare the German population in the context of national emergency for harsher measures, such as mass deportations and eventually genocide. And right now, the American population is feeling very xenophobic, in part because they've been duped by Donald Trump to think that immigrants are the cause of all of our problems, but also because Democrats haven't been pushing back against this xenophobic rhetoric, and they've also shifted to the right on the issue of immigration. So, I mean, as Mark Twain put it, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And I think that it's understandable to be fearful after seeing the parallels between Hitler's Germany and Trump's America, even if they're not identical. But the difference between us and the Weimar Republic is that our democracy, as flawed as it is, has withstood the test of time up until this point. The problem is that Trump has systematically eroded checks and balances. And it's kind of hanging on by a thread at this point. The institutions that protected us the last time won't necessarily protect us this time if he's elected. And he has a plan to dismantle the things that protect us. Project 2025, one of the first things he'd do is implement Schedule F, which would give him total control of the executive branch. No checks and balances anymore. And to make matters worse, Trump is pretty open about the fact that he doesn't believe in democracy, which is something that no fascists believe in. And rather than assuaging the fears of Americans who worry about him becoming a dictator, he said point blank that he would be a dictator for a day, which is how it always starts, right? He even told Christians that they'd never have to vote again if they vote for him this one last time. And unsurprisingly, him and his allies are already laying the groundwork for another coup attempt in 2024 if they lose. Trust the process this time around. I'll let you know in about uh, 33 days. I, d I think there is going to be some cheating in this election. I think non-citizens are going to vote. Who, who won the 2020 election? Did you, just the answer, did, did Donald Trump win yes or no? Yes. He did win. Yep. Do you believe he lost the 2020 election? I think that Donald Trump and I have both raised a number of issues with the 2020 election, but we're focused on the future. I think there's an obsession here with focusing on 2020. I'm much more worried about what happened after 2020, which is a wide open border, groceries that are unaffordable. And look- Senator, Lulu, yes or no? Okay. Did Donald Trump lose the 2020 election? Well, let me ask you a question. Is it okay that big technology companies censored the Hunter Biden laptop story, which independent analysis have said cost Donald Trump millions of votes. Senator Vance, I'm going to ask you again, did Donald Trump lose the 2020 election? Did big technology companies censor a story that independent studies have suggested would have cost Trump millions of votes? Senator I think that's Vance, the question. I'm going to ask you again, did Donald Trump lose the 2020 election? And I've election? answered your question with another question. You answer my question and I'll answer yours. I have asked this question repeatedly. It is something that is very important for the American people to know. There is no proof, legal or otherwise, that Donald Trump did not lose the 2020 you're, election. You're repeating a slogan rather than engaging with what I'm saying. Senator, would you have certified the election in 2020? Yes or no? I've said that I would have voted against certification because of the concern that I just raised. I think that when you have technology companies- The answer is no. In interview after interview, question after question, and in the debate, you refuse to say that Donald Trump lost the 2020 election. So I'm just gonna assume that if, if I ask you 50 times whether he lost the election, you would not acknowledge that he did. Is that correct? 
Martha, you've, you've, you asked this question. I've been asked this question 10 times in the past couple of weeks. Of course, Donald Trump and I believe there were problems in 2020. You haven't asked about inflation. The uh, no, no, I'm industry. sorry. Let's stick the to American this. People, I know. The I American know. people want us to talk Why about how to make their lives that? better. They Why don't want us to. Why won't you say that? Because... Because, Martha, I believe that in 2020, when big tech firms were censoring American citizens, that created very serious problems. But Actually, Martha, I don't understand why you won't just say Kamala it if Harris, you believe it. She's, well, won't just say what? That I think the 2020 election had some problems? I've said that repeatedly. Did Donald Trump lose? That's the question. And you know that's the question. Martha, I've said repeatedly, I think the 2020 election had problems. You want to say rigged? You want to say he won? Use whatever vocabulary term you want. I want to focus on the fact that we had big technology firms censoring our fellow citizens. That is incredibly rich since Donald Trump pressured Elon Musk to censor journalist Ken Klippenstein for publishing the J.D. Vance dossier in the same way that Twitter suppressed the Hunter Biden laptop story for a day. They said that was bad, but apparently censoring Ken Klippenstein is A-OK. But put aside that hypocrisy and understand that their unwillingness to accept the results of the election will be used as a future justification to systematically dismantle democracy. This is something that all fascists have to do because democracy is an impediment to their absolute power. And Trump and his cronies may be banking on taking back power even if they lose the election, as some Hartman eloquently points out in an op-ed for Common Dreams. Now, Trump can theoretically do this if states refuse to certify the election if it's close in order to throw it to the House or the Supreme Court, which is possible because the Electoral Count Act doesn't have any penalties for the 70-plus Trump-aligned election officials in swing states who have broadcasted their intent to not certify the election if Trump loses. And if they don't certify the election and that ends up throwing it to a vote in the House of Representatives, well, the problem is that it's controlled by Republicans and the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, is an election denier himself who voted against certifying the last election. But even if Donald Trump wins fairly, that doesn't mean that he still won't be hellbent on destroying democracy, even if it benefited him, because before Hitler became a dictator, he was also democratically elected. As Matthew Rose of Salon explains, although the Nazis never won more than 37.3% of the vote in an election, they were able to leverage that minority into seizing power in 1933. Shortly after that, they began to systematically dismantle the democracy that had been created after the German Revolution, suppress and murder political opponents, implement policies that oppress Jews and other minority groups, and lay the foundations for an aggressive foreign policy to reestablish a German empire. Over over and over again, these actions were rationalized as being not exactly evil or discriminatory, but as a necessary response to the fact that so many people were convinced Germany would have won the Great War, as it was called at the time, if it hadn't been stabbed in the back by a cabal of enemies. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that I think Trump plans to murder his political opponents, but I do think you'd be naive to assume that he wouldn't at least try to suppress them at a minimum. And America also didn't just face defeat like Germany did, that's comparable to World War I, of course, but Trump's Make America Great Again slogan conjures up this idea that we were a once great nation that's fallen from grace for a number of reasons, namely immigration, but there's multiple common enemies that he's been invoking to point to to kind of signal why America is on the decline. But in conclusion, I think it is fair to say that there are a lot of similarities between Donald Trump and Hitler. But of course, Trump is not Hitler. Trump is Trump. And I don't think that this comparison is going to dissuade his supporters from voting against him because Trump has formed a cult of personality around him, akin to how Hitler also formed a cult of personality around him too. But I'm not invoking Hitler to prime you into thinking of him whenever you see Donald Trump's face. That's not the goal of this video, but it is useful to make this comparison so that way we can learn from history and understand how a demagogue like that came to power in the first place. Because when you read the history books, it is inconceivable that society in Germany allowed that to happen. But you need to understand that it's not as simple as, hey, we're evil, we're going to kill everybody. And people were like, yay, it's complex, it's nuanced. And the same thing that happened there in some ways is happening here, albeit differently and to a different target or targets, I should say. And I think it's necessary to learn about the tactics of all fascists of the past and present in order to adequately address this violent brand of authoritarian politics that's becoming increasingly popular as our world and political system crumbles around us. But I don't think that you're a hysterical liberal for worrying about the threat that Donald Trump poses. You are logical and reasonable if you actually think that he poses a threat, 
because he does in a multitude of ways. It doesn't make you a lame resistance lib to realize this. It makes you a student of history that understands what we're facing currently. There is a reason why historians like Jason Stanley and Ruth ben Gayet are saying what Trump is doing is very similar to other fascists throughout history, including Adolf Hitler. So if we plug our ears and, you know, close our eyes and just ignore this threat that we're seeing and ignore the similarities, I think we do that at our own peril. Mike is a total shit lip. Once he started chilling for the DNC, I stopped watching. So I definitely won't be hitting the subscribe button or turning on notifications by clicking the bell. No way. It's very sad, I know.